Welcome to Outside Ourselves, a podcast featuring conversations that remind us faith isn't something we do, it's something we receive. I'm Kelsey Quimbera. Today, I'm chatting with author and writer Hannah Anderson about her newest book, Heaven and Nature Sing. This book is actually a collection of Advent devotionals. So as we are entering that season, that church season this year, I am really looking forward to bringing this conversation to you. Uh, And Hannah's book, which we talk about today, she uh, does an amazing job of presenting the hope of Advent as both the birth of Jesus Christ through the incarnation, as well as the hope that we all have in Christ for his second coming. And she links these hopes with nature, with creation, uh, pointing us to the fact that God is working to redeem all things, not just us, but his creatureliness, which is a part of us and all around us. It's a really interesting conversation. As always, I hope you enjoy. Hannah, I'm so happy to have the opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. I know that you have just written this new Advent devotional, Heaven and Nature Sing. So if you want to just maybe tell us a little bit about the book, kind of why you decided to write it, I think that'd be a great place to start. Sure. Um, You know, I don't think I ever anticipated writing an Advent book. Um, I'm not sure I ever anticipated writing to begin with, to be truthful. A lot of my work over the last few years has taken me by surprise more than anyone else. Um, mm. But I I have been a writer for about 10 years now. Um, and one of my books, I think it may have been back in 2016, I wrote a book called Humble Roots. Mm. And I really drew on themes from the natural world. I live in Southwest Virginia, the Blue Ridge Mountains. My husband and I both have deep roots kind of in gardening, homesteading spaces. Um, And so I was just pulling on themes that were very familiar to me in terms of agrarian themes and botanical Mm. themes. And I found that they kind of connected with readers in a way that surprised me. And so after that book, I started pulling on that thread a little bit more in my writing, kind of leaning into what does nature um, teach us? What does natural revelation and the creation have to say about who God is? And just began pulling on those threads. And then my last book was a collection of essays through the seasons. Now, because of where we live, um, you know, we experience all four seasons um, throughout the year. And so I did this kind of set of essays, um, just walking through those, trying to kind of establish reflections or observations about the natural world and linking that to scripture. And then when that project was completed, I knew it was not the last I wanted to write on this. It it seemed to kind of grow in me this desire to cultivate a conversation around uh, creation and uh, spiritual formation and um, the scripture. And Mm -hmm. when you start talking in those themes, very, very quickly, you end up at a theology of incarnation. You Mm -hmm. you get to Jesus Christ coming into the world, coming into creation and that delivers you to Advent. and that delivers you to the Christmas time really quickly. And so as I was tracing actually the theological themes, it became very, very clear that one of the best ways to kind of sit with this conversation was to consider it in context of the creator coming into flesh, coming into the material world. Yeah. And really just considering all of that within context of Advent and the nativity season. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I, I want to get to Advent, but I'm curious, you said when you first started writing about nature, it really connected with people in a way you, that kind of surprised you. Why, why do you think that that, like what stood out to people about that? Yeah, it was so strange because it's, a, it was strange that it surprised me, I think first, yeah. because what seemed really Um, intuitive to me, very natural to me, given my background, I found was resonating with readers in a way um, that seemed new to them. So I had Mm -hmm. folks write me and say, oh, I read your book. I love the theology. And also I planted tomatoes for the first time. 
or hmm. someone else wrote and said, I bought an apple tree and I planted it because I read in your book that you all had planted heirloom apple trees. And so it was these little points of engagement that I realized, I began to realize, and forgive me, this is so oblivious, but I began to realize that my experience of growing up the way I did was not shared and that there was something deeply gifted to me and having grown up in a home that was both very close to the earth and also very deeply rooted in scripture. And so my husband was in a similar kind of background. And I think between the two of us, we, we just didn't understand how unique that gift was in this moment in time, yeah. um, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, as the digital age has just exploded, as we spend more and more time detached from the earth, um, detached from its rhythms and cycles. And so much of our life is happening, you know, on screens or inside buildings. And so what I think people were longing for, if I can sum it up, is they were longing for an access point back to creation. Mm. Um, They were longing for that connection point to the material world, to their own embodied selves. And it really became clear that this was something that we desperately needed at this point in human history that maybe in the past didn't need as much cultivation, but it does now. Yeah. Yeah. We need more reminders of it probably now Mm -hmm. than we've had, had in the past. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, you, you know, in, in your devotional, I feel like something I picked up on you saying is, is that nature doesn't necessarily, um, point us to the beauty of God's creation. That's one thing it can do, Mm -hmm. but that it, it points out to us our need for God. Um, I think you use the word ally, like we're allies with creation when it comes to groaning and hoping for redemption. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that distinction? Because I think it's a, I think it's an important one. Um, and it's really beautiful. I think it's a beautiful theme in in your writing. So when I started writing in this direction and thinking in this direction, one of the first things I encountered is that we tended to have a very sentimental view of nature and creation. So there was a a responsiveness I found among readers to, to hear more about the creation. But when I would go look for resources or I would engage people in conversation, it had this kind of sheen of um, almost sense mentality and saw creation as um, a place of escape and comfort, which it Mm. is. But having grown up the way I did, I also knew that nature um, had a brutal side to it. It had a brokenness to it that I think you don't necessarily encounter until you've actually spent time in creation or you've tried to put a garden in and you plant that tomato plant And then you learn about fungus and worms and drought, and you begin to realize that nature isn't quite as domesticated as our Instagram um, feeds maybe show us. Yeah. So I I felt like there was this um, simultaneous need to help people remember what Paul writes in Romans 8, that the creation is groaning and longing. Um, It is longing for redemption as much as we are, that it's longing for the sons of God to be revealed. And even if we, um, you know, consider passages in Genesis 3 that kind of talk about the curse descending on the earth, nature is among the things mentioned that comes under this curse. Um, You know, the ground is going to bring forth thorns and and weeds and thistles. And so one of the the things with this book that I hope to kind of present to people is the thought that we're all, the entire cosmos is longing for Mm. their creator king. Um, We feel it. We know that longing, but we have this ally um, to bring forward the language of the book in creation that's also Mm. longing and hoping uh for redemption that comes through christ yeah yeah that's beautiful that's so i mean yeah it's so necessary i think we forget as christians like you can't just look outside and know 
that God loves you because there are hurricanes and blizzards and uh, childbirth, like all of these things um, don't point to his goodness. What we need is, is the incarnation. We need um, Christ to tell us that. And so, yeah, that's, that's really great. That kind of gets us to Advent. And I know in your introduction, you talk about, um, I think you say like splitting the difference between what is commonly thought of as Advent. Some of our viewers will probably be familiar with Advent, but, but could you kind of walk us through what you mean by um, sure. the two ways that Advent is approached and how you decided to approach it? Sure. So, um, you know, just confession up front, I didn't grow up with Advent beyond viewing it as a way to count down the days before Christmas. Yeah. So I think in many people's experiences, definitely like in low church or evangelical experiences, Advent was akin to maybe a calendar that you bought that you opened the doors and there was a piece of candy hiding behind each door right. or you took off. The, the days until Christmas. And it was a lead up to Christmas of a sort, but it was more like, let's get these days out of the way as fast as we possibly can, because we really want to get to our presents, yeah. which we all understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but there was this, this kind of uh, understanding of the weeks before Christmas they were full of festivity and the celebration, but also by the time you got to Christmas, you were pretty exhausted mm -hmm. in, in my memory. Um, and you would put your Christmas tree up maybe right after Thanksgiving in the last few weeks of, or maybe even into um, November. And so by the time December 25th rolled around, all you wanted to do was get through the day and then begin to pack up the next week. Yeah. As an adult, I came into um, greater understanding of the historic nature of Advent. Um, and churches that are more liturgical or have ancient roots um, have preserved this for the rest of us, um, an understanding of Advent the weeks before Christmas as weeks of longing um, and lament and mm -hmm. preparing ourselves for why we even need a savior. And, and historically, these weeks would focus as much on the second coming of Christ um, as the first that we celebrate right. at Christmas time. Yeah. And I think another thing that kind of surprised me as I was learning uh, as an adult is that this opens the Christian calendar year rather mm -hmm. than closing it. Closing and it. in our modern civil calendar, by the time we get to December, we're thinking about shutting things down. Um, so Advent actually gives us an opportunity to begin our year with Christ, to begin uh, a way of longing and reflecting and thinking about why we even needed the Savior to come into creation in the first place. Yeah, that's great. As you um, as you were writing this and 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 finished it, are there specific themes that jumped out at you that you weren't expecting? Um, did anything kind of surprise you as you were writing the devotional that you didn't yeah. think was there? Yeah. Well, I think when all was said and done, the thing that um, I found the most compelling was to view Advent as an invitation um, into grace and away from performance rather than an obligation. And that felt very freeing because for folks who maybe haven't grown up with the church calendar and want to adopt some of these practices, who see the value of it, who understand um, the importance of rhythms and cycles, it can sometimes feel like, okay, here's something I need to do. Here's yeah. something that if I add it to my life and I tick it off my list and I learn how to do it. I will be better. My family will be better. My children will be better. And in this weird way, um, what is supposed to be an invitation to limits and to a confession of our need becomes um, an act of performance. Mm -hmm. And so as I was uh, working through writing this, as I was sitting with it myself, I realized how much creation was waiting in hope 
not trying to perform for its creator. And Mm -hmm. that was such an invitation to us as creatures within the creation um, to wait in that same hope and be willing to maybe um, set aside the impulse to perform during the holiday season. And I think what's curious about the holiday season, at least the way we celebrate it um, in the modern West, it has become a way of projecting our joy, projecting our perfection, Mm -hmm. projecting our ability to keep it all together and have these really picturesque experiences. And that runs counter um, to the invitation of Advent. So um, I felt this relief, I think, in learning that this was an invitation and permission to live in my humanity and live in my need of grace uh, rather than an obligation to perform some kind of uh, religious duty or religious practice. Yeah, that's so great. I think that that's a comfort I found um, in the in the church calendar and even in liturgy in general of the this idea that it's a rhythm not because um, not because we have to do anything, but it's a rhythm to remind us and bring us back to the comforts of Christ over and over again. Um, And I think nature obviously does that too, which is so great. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons I found this kind of inherent logic between um, Advent, which is very rhythmic, as you point out, and also creation that even as we as people are kind of rushing around in a very hurried and distracted age, there are these rhythms within the natural world that really don't change, even though it's the digital age. Um, You know, the sun still rises and sets. We still have 24 hours in a day. The earth still rotates. Um, If we live in places that have different seasons, they still come and go. And so there's this backdrop within creation of stability, of patience almost, of Um, I I like to think that maybe creation is just looking at us with a sense of um, bemusement and maybe boredom (laughs) at the way we run around as human beings. And yet those cycles just remain really steady, um, despite all the other changes that are happening within human history. Yeah, I think there's a reason why um, that we're described as trees needing to bear fruit um because we we always take that metaphor and run with it thinking like okay i've got to bear fruit i've got to bear fruit when in actuality like a tree needs a gardener and a tree has to be made good in order to bear good fruit um the gardener is the one doing all the work not the tree itself so it's funny because we still are are of course capable of turning that and twisting that into something we have to do and yet God, through his word, is constantly using nature um, Mm -hmm. to to point us back to our reliance on him. You say the miracle of the incarnation is that the timeless son entered time. And that really struck me because, you know, the incarnation we typically think of in physical terms, not necessarily temporal. Can you talk a little bit about um, this difference and specifically Mm -hmm. what the incarnation means for time and our experience of time? Well, I think, again, as you mentioned, we we tend to think of the incarnation in the material realm of um, Jesus took on a body, so he honored our bodies and we should embrace their limits. We can live within the material realm. We don't have to transcend it somehow or, um, you know, seek this higher life. We, we, Hmm live out our days faithfully within the boundaries of our creatureliness. And we learned that from the incarnation. But I think one of the things that is tangential to that and one that we don't give as much attention to is um, that we are creatures of time and that Jesus himself, when he became human, became a creature of time. There was um, a limit on his days on this earth. He was fixed within generational realities. I think when I was writing, that was one of the things that really struck me very early on in the writing was these genealogies that we have 
of Jesus. And there's lots of reasons that those are in the scripture. But the thing that struck me was that Jesus was a link or he was coming from generations of people that had lived their days out on the earth and then died Hmm. and then handed off the stewardship of what they knew to the next generation. Yeah. And I think for us within this moment, um, in time and in this culture, we don't have a strong sense of ourselves, generally speaking, as being links within generations um, mm. of what we've received. We tend to think of ourselves as kind of self-created, that we just kind of came yeah. on the scene. Um, but because we don't have a sense of our place in time, both in the past, generationally, we don't always think of ourselves in the future. We don't think of what mm. we're passing along to generations yet to come. And so, so this idea of being creatures bound by time and Jesus coming into time, I think it, it's a particularly important within Advent because what we're doing is we're receiving rhythms that have been cultivated over the generations. And, and hopefully we're stewarding those rhythms that we can then pass forward to those who will come after us, who will also carry them on, realizing that our part in this large process is, is very limited. Mm, you know, we yeah. may have 70, 80, 90 years on this earth if we're lucky. Um, and what one person can accomplish in those years um, is fairly limited. And so again, that calls us back to reliance on a God who is transcendent and timeless, yeah. that he would take the work, the small amount of work that we do and somehow use it in his timeless plan. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I, we live, we are fortunate in some ways, I guess, um, to live in a, in a time period where we feel like we are not limited by time. I know that's how, that's how I live my day all like, all the time is just that I can get whatever I need to get done and I can get more done than I need to get done because we're so productive these days. Um, exactly. Yeah. So that's, that is a good reminder. And the, tr the reality is even though we live that way, we are obviously still constrained mm -hmm. by time <laughs> and, yeah. and it's a, and it becomes a burden because I think we can, I don't know. It's almost like we think we can outwit or, outwork time that's how yeah, at least personally yeah we can outsmart it um and to be reminded no that's part of like fall mm -hmm. our, our limitations and our fallen nature too is that that is a very very real constraint we're not <laughs> we are not gonna get out of um is helpful especially during during this season for sure yeah and it and I think in particular, our inability to practice certain spiritual practices or rhythms is deeply connected to our idea of productivity. So yeah. these kinds of uh, rhythms are, are slower. They slow us down. Uh, they cause us, they disrupt how much we can get done in a day if we give attention to these kinds of spiritual practices. And they don't necessarily have an immediate objective or an immediate result. Yeah. And so there's a lot of trust and faith going into um, resisting the urgency of the immediate, the, the temptation of productivity, um, to be able to attend to these deeper patterns and habits um, that are timeless, even though we experience them within time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not, maybe they're not even meant to be productive in and of themselves. Like they're not, they're not meant to be measured, but that's so outside of how we think we think we right. can measure right. everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, I think that's very comforting and freeing. Um, at least it is, at least it is for me today. Most kids grow up with this idea of longing and hoping for Christmas that is kind of encapsulated in Advent. Um, I, I was, you know, even as I was preparing for today, the, the phrase, the thrill of hope, like that to mm -hmm. me is kind of what Christmas is, is this hopefulness that's thrilling. Um, do you see that at all as a 
part of Advent or a part of the, the Christian life? Um, and I don't know, that that's kind of a very general question, but I'm curious of where that kind of fits in, in your mind to Advent. Yeah, I think it, absolutely this kind of longing that brings fruition and hope is absolutely a deeply Christian um, impulse. And I think it's present in our holiday, you know, kind of celebrations, regardless of whether we identify it within Advent or not. Um, I think the one challenge to us is whether that hope um, has a resolution in in the coming of the Savior as a baby. And then we're like, oh, good, he came. I don't need to hope anymore. <laughs> so, mm. so one of the things I've noticed that Advent does is it points our attention to the coming of Christ as a baby, right? Mm-hmm. It kind of resolves yeah. in Christmas, but because it is also attending to the second coming of Christ, it is simultaneously layering our need that we still exist in. So, yeah. so one of the tensions, one of the things we might miss if we don't, um, you know, kind of attune to the messages of Advent and we just kind of have this vague hope that's going to be resolved in Christmas, is that Advent is also telling us, yes, the Savior came, but things are still bad. (laughs) Like things are still a struggle. Um, There's still brokenness in the world. So how do we attune an answer for that? And Mm -hmm. so if our theology only has that one dimension if our if our like nativity theology only has the one dimension of i'm longing for the savior to come oh good he came as a baby and he died on the cross and he was raised again therefore we're all fine Mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily have the capacity to explain if we're all fine why is the world still groaning why is suffering still happening why are things still hard And so I think the unique promise of Advent then is it takes that hope that's initially found in Christmas and it builds it out to this bigger, grander hope of the return of Christ to rule and reign over his creation. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true um, that Christmas is the fulfillment of God's promise to redeem us in one way, but, um, and then we know, you know, the cross is Mm -hmm. another layer of that, but then we are still awaiting his, his return. And without that, you're so right. We don't, we don't know how to make sense of hurt and suffering in the world. And we don't know how to make sense of our own, our own sin and our own suffering and our Mm -hmm. own, um, our own brokenness still as we, as we wait. Yeah. Yeah, And I think for me, one of the pieces that dropped or changed in my own understanding of what I was longing for and hoping for is in some of the spaces I grew up in when I we encountered suffering it was dealt with by looking to the cross um, of saying well um, Jesus died for you he rose again so you won't have to suffer in eternity you'll suffer here but Mm. you're safe so you know, you can have comfort that there won't be suffering later. I think that's a different kind of consolation than saying, yes, we're suffering now, but Jesus is ushering in a new creation through the resurrection. We are looking for ourselves to be resurrected and redeemed. We're looking for all the loss and brokenness that we experience to be remade, that um, Jesus is actively making things new. And, and that's a, it's a very different consolation than simply pointing us, um, you know, back in one layering. All of those things are true, but they need to interact with each other in a way that Advent invites us into that both points us to the first coming and life and ministry and death and resurrection of Christ, but ultimately is pointing us to his ongoing work, the work that mm. continues um, and, and the work of the Holy Spirit's presence with us, even while we groan and wait for the consummation of the age. Hmm. Yeah. Would you say it's a, a deepening of the, the first mm-hmm. belief in a way? 
Yeah, I, I, it's in no way a negation of it. Yeah, it's more yeah. of a yes, and it's even better than that. Like the, yeah. these things are true and real, but but here's how they expand out into a much more cosmic. Um, they expand out in all directions, you know, hmm. time and eternity, and and all of these layering. So I think that kind of um, call to rest in the um the the finished work of christ but the ongoing work of christ Mm. as well if you wanted to leave people with one thing from reading the devotional or maybe even just one thing about advent what would you hope that they they would take i would hope um and this goes back to something we discussed a little bit earlier i would hope they would find um a sense of relief and hope in the grace of God, in the embrace of uh, their own need, of their own creatureliness, that they would find in creation um, partners um, in that waiting and longing, and that there would be permission um, to just need, um, Mm. permission to, to lament and long for the one who has come to save and, and has come to fulfill all of these longings. And so um, I think it's a weird kind of comfort when you finally come to the end of yourself and say, okay, so I can't do it. Yeah. Um, but I know the one who can. And so yeah. pointing our eyes back to that and all the ways that grace and love are manifest in this season. Um, I would just hope that that would provide a kind of, uh, peace and and maybe stability um, in a season that can be marked by a lot of busyness and distraction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Man, every, I feel like I keep coming, running into this theme of creatureliness. Um, obviously, that's a big part of your writing and your work. And I think it's something that I, to me, it seems very important in our day and age of um, hearing and being reminded that we are creatures, we're not creators. Is mm. that true for you? Have you found have you found comfort in that? Um, and if so, what would you say is stands out to you as 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 the most comforting part of being God's creature? Right. Um, I absolutely find comfort in it, and I think. Um, one of the reasons I write about it so much is because I'm so prone to resist it. Yeah. So I am prone to be a very busy person, um, a very anxious person, a very productive person. And um, I, I think at least the writers I know, you can get a peek into their soul by what they are wrestling with through their writing. So so people read my books and they assume I'm this very Zen person <laughs> because of the things I give attention to. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. This is what I must give attention to. This mm. is what um, I have to discipline myself to see and to remember and to live in because left to myself, I would be a very frenetic, anxious, um, busy person. And so for me, the invitation into creatureliness um, and to limits and to trusting God's transcendence and not mine um, has been, uh, you know, I hate to use this language, but it's been a coping. It's the way I've been able to cope with my life, able to have the truth of God and the theology of um, creaturely limits be the check that is needed within my own life. So um, this is more about maybe preaching the gospel to myself um, and everybody else gets to listen in. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's being creatures is in having a God that's a creator. Obviously that's, you know, the basic story of, of scripture. And yet it's so easy to forget. We think that we can build on God's work in mm-hmm. some way. And so we need to hear it over and over again, I think from each other and, um, and from the words, words of scripture. So that's, that's a great, great reminder. Mm-hmm. I have found a lot of comfort in that lately. So I appreciate you kind of bringing some light to it. Um, 
I, I, you know, want to be able to direct people to where your work is and where they can get the book. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about that, where they can find the devotional? And then if you have anything else coming up that we should be on the lookout for. So folks can go to sometimes That's my web site. Um, okay. It's just kind of a landing page for collecting all the things I do. Um, that's sometimes a I am on Instagram and I'm on Twitter uh, for now. We'll see how Twitter goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so wild book, west. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, the book is available at most outlets. Um, you know, you can either find it um, online at some smaller uh, bookstores. You can find it from the publisher B and H. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. So it's it's pretty available. Um, the if folks come to my site, we, we are selling some there as well with some artwork. My husband did the artwork um, yeah. in the book. So it's beautiful. We pre- We've created some note cards um, and some things that go along with it. So those things are on um, the site. And yeah, I think as far as things that are coming down the the pike for us, um, we're really just going to lean into this conversation about nature. It's become something that we feel like God has really brought to me as a writer and also my husband as an artist. He's been able to collaborate with me on these last few books. And we even have um, next spring, we have a children's book coming out is based on Psalm 104. So we just really feel like God is opening up this lane for us to kind of begin to help people focus attention in that direction. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you. Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast. To learn more about all of our podcasts, go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts. We have a ton of resources coming out this Advent and Christmas season, so make sure that you stay up to date with what we are creating at 1517. You can subscribe to our newsletter to get that information or follow us on social media as well. Thanks as always. We will be back here in a couple weeks with our next show.